Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary, for a tent was constructed. The first one, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the bread of the presence. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the Holy of Holies. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not yet been disclosed, as long as the first tent is still standing. This is a symbol of the present time, during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipper, but deal only with food and drink and various baptisms, regulations for the body imposed until the time comes to set things right. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that have come, then though the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance, <laughs> because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sacrifices those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified. Okay, Matt will come up for his first sermon. Brace yourselves. Don't worry, it's short. <laughs> So yes, I apologise. The sermon in two parts, but I've timed it. It comes out to less than a 20-minute sermon by itself. So don't stress too much. We're going to be all right. You'll be able to go and have hot cross buns and everything. <laughs> My name is Matt. Um, I currently work here doing the uh, sort of coordinating the youth group, um, and I've been coming to this church for a little while now. So as Lucinda introduced. This term, uh, the youth group has been talking about what happened on the cross and why it mattered so much. Because in my opinion, today we celebrate the most important day in history. Now that might be a bit contentious, you might say. Why not Sunday? Why not Christmas? Why not, um, I don't know, pick your holiday. But <laughs> so, 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 so why do I think this? To me, I think this discussion, the, the reason for this season, starts with the temple, the, uh, the building at the centre of Hebrew worship and faith, and, and life and culture and everything to do with it. I think that this building, this temple, is what we need to talk about on Good Friday because Jesus tells us in John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he was speaking of the temple of his body. So how do we get to a point where this, this temple building is actually Jesus' body? His physical human body, as we heard last Sunday. And what does it mean that this temple was destroyed on a crucifix, on a cross? And then what does it mean that it was raised in three days? And maybe before all that, what is a temple? <laughs> right. See, is a temple, I think for most of us, maybe we think maybe a temple is a bit like a church. You know, it's, it's not just the building, but it's the, it's the people in it, you know, because that's what we often say, uh, which is a bit true, but not, not really. So a temple, and I've got the, the diagram of the, the temple as it was laid out in, in, in the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Old Testament, a temple is a place of God's presence. So a few definitions here. The word that we translate for church, which is the word ecclesia, means gathering of those summoned. Right? So a church is the people in it. But when we speak of a temple, we're actually referring to, well, from Hebrew, it's the word mikdash, which refers to the building as a, as a palace or as a, as a physical place. And then, importantly, we have this other word, tabernacle. Now, tabernacle means to dwell. It is a place of living. It is a home. 
So when we speak of the tabernacle within the temple, the temple is the place that God lives on earth. The temple is the place for the creator amongst creation. So the Hebrew, Hebrew temple, as I say, was constructed a bit like this. It's arranged in courts, it's arranged in layers almost, like an onion or an ogre, moving from the outer area inwards. Each layer is a little bit removed from the world outside. And therefore, by definition, is increasingly holy, increasingly sacred, and increasingly separated from. And that's part of the point, because the temple is a place that really, really matters, and it needs to be kept safe and holy and pure. So the sacrifices happen in this altar on quite a regular basis. And then there's this holy place. Just got to make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. There's this holy place, which is a, another, originally a tent. And the holy place was reserved for, for priests and Levites, who with, inside the holy place is this other holy place called the Holy of Holies, the holiest place. And this is behind a curtain. And behind this curtain, it's only entered once a year, every year, by the high priest. And in the Holy of Holies is the tabernacle, where God dwells on earth. It's God's home in a physical place within creation. So the temple is built to, to structure this place and to remind us that as we approach the Holy of Holies, we walk on holy ground, like our God tells Moses in Exodus 3 at this burning bush. Next slide, please. So the first tabernacle. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> when I got here, I realized my laptop was dead, and so I don't have my actual PowerPoint, so this is an improvised one. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so the first tabernacle was not this one that was instructed in Exodus. The first tabernacle was the Garden of Eden that we hear described in Genesis. Now, I think it's important that we actually learn to read the Bible in this way because when we realize how that sort of original account is written, we realize that maybe it's not describing a historical event, but it's describing a place where God dwelt on earth in perfect communion with humanity, where the creator lived with the created and it was good. But what we get is this, this picture of Eden, which is constructed with these two trees in the middle. And the two trees are the tree of, of, of uh, I mean, whatever, like, it's, it's poetic and it's fun language and everything, but it, it's constructed in that same way the temple is, moving from the outer world into the Holy of Holies. Thank you so much. Haggard's bread, everybody. <laughs> so this is a lovely little diagram I got from the Bible Project. It's drastically simplified, right? Because, you know, we're dealing with poetry and we're dealing with, like, books and books worth of information describing how this place should be built and structured. But this, on the top, we have sort of the, the layout of the Garden of Eden in, in really simple terms. And then on the bottom, we have the way that the temple was laid out. And so you can see you go from the tree of life in the center of the garden, the garden, the land of Eden, and then the dry land outside. Now in Exodus, in, sorry, in Genesis chapter three, we get this description of when humanity broke that relationship with God, when the creators tried to become the created and upset that, very complicated, very big, we can talk about it later, God pushed them out, removed, removed them from this most holy place and put up a, a barrier with a, a sword of fire and a cherubim. How cool. That's what this curtain represents in the new temple as it was constructed. By putting this curtain over the tabernacle, we remind ourselves that actually we broke relationship in that first temple, in that first home of God among creation. But importantly, and I think this is the point of the Garden of Eden story, God never gave up this vision 
of dwelling with us. And so God appeared to Moses in a flaming bush and introduced God's self, saying, I am who I am. I am being itself. I am Yahweh. And God teaches Moses to teach the Hebrews how to live with God as best they can, how to best live in right relationship with each other and with our God. And instructs the building of this tent instructs the building of this curtain, instructs the building of this tabernacle in order to work towards a new creation where we are able to live in perfect communion with our creator. So God in this place, in this tabernacle, in this tent, in this temple was present in spirit and through practice but not in flesh. And they carried the tent around until they reached a land that they contested to be their homeland. And here, it was turned into a permanent building. The walls of Eden became a curtain, which meant that at once a year, someone would enter God's presence. A lot less than consistent, than constant, but a lot better than nothing. Working towards it. And so the law then was handed down to make it safe to live with this temple among them replete with purification guidelines, instructions in life and culture and community and food and drink and how to live a good life. And the people sacrificed and they entered God's presence as close as they could, as often as they could. Years later, in the year 587 BC, Babylon invaded and the temple was destroyed. And they wrote the Old Testament down. They compiled it with the law because it was no longer safe to tell these stories orally. The Babylonians took many of the people away and held them as slaves in a foreign land, unable to return to the place of God's dwelling as they needed to. Eventually Babylon relented and the people returned to rebuild the temple the way it was before. And this took them 46 years. Now, not long before the birth of Jesus, Jerusalem was again inhabited by an empire that did not know Yahweh, an empire that would go on to destroy the temple again, the empire of Rome. This empire rewarded those who submitted willingly and slaughtered those who did not. This empire had an emperor who was described as the son of God, Augustus Caesar, Princeps Senatus of Rome. Princeps Senatus means first among equals of the Senate. And it came with a special purple robe and a crown only he is allowed to wear. In the book of Revelation, we are told that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. And he carries a cross to proclaim God's new kingdom. A kingdom where the first shall be last and the last shall be first. A kingdom like a mustard seed that grows not into a tree but into a weed. It gets through the whole field. A kingdom made up of those who came last in Rome, those who came last in Babylon, and those who most seem to have broken relationship. And so into this context, <clears throat> God, who the one who is who he is, decided to do a new thing. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God made a new tabernacle, a new dwelling place on earth. In the body of a baby boy known as Jesus, the son of Mary, from the house of David, A boy who was a tradesman, a boy who couldn't point to where his blood father was. A boy whose name means Yahweh saves, whose title is Emmanuel, God among us, tabernacle. This child, the new tabernacle, the new dwelling place on God on earth, the new covenant, God's new thing. And this boy grew and claimed to be able to rebuild the temple in three days. 
People were left stunned because it took 46 years to build the last one. But Jesus was saying something even more impossible than that. Because for years, Jesus then built power with the disenfranchised among the people of Jerusalem and around it. He built community with sex workers, with tax collectors, with the sick and the outcasts, with children and with old people. And he came to the well when no one was there. And to these people, Jesus declared a new empire, the kingdom of Yahweh. This kingdom was upside down. In God's kingdom, in Yahweh's kingdom, the first became last. And it was these last who became first. And so on the Sunday before Passover, God's temple, Jesus, entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey at the head of this kingdom of losers and derelicts. And on Thursday, Jesus ate his last meal with his friends. And some of them decided that maybe they weren't actually going to win in God's new kingdom. Some of them feared Rome enough to submit. And we come to Friday, where we put an innocent man to death. Where God's new temple, the one who came to dwell among us by taking on a fully human body, we killed. We rejected Emmanuel. We asked God to not be with us once again. We tore down God's temple. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that, saw that in his, this way, he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. All right, Matt will come up with, for sermon part two. So I've been preaching for a few years now. I think I did my first one in 2020, which was pretty cool, going like straight online. And in my first sermon, I went hard and I, I found a book by Walter Brueggemann. And um, I went through and unpacked the use of the Hebrew word uh, kudr, which means, I probably jangled that word up, but it means to cut or to tear. And in this sermon, I was looking at um, the, book of, the second book of Kings, chapter 22. Again, a crazy thing to do in my first sermon. Um, because the book of Kings is full of, of fun beheadings and crazy, like, really hard things happening and then saying, and that was really cool. And it's like, ooh, how do you actually talk about that in a solid way? And anyway, so what I did <laughs> in this chapter where a prophet presents the king of Judah with the book of the law, and in this book, it points out the idolatrous behaviours that come with being king. This passage mimics a passage from Jeremiah in chapter 36. Now, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah describes a similar event where a different king, Jehoiakim, who had turned away from Yahweh. Can I get the first slide up? Thank you very much. Jeremiah describes this king, Jehoiakim, as causing suffering during his reign. And in Jeremiah's telling, Jehoiakim was sitting in his winter apartment and there was a fire burning in the brazier before him. And as Jehudi, the prophet, reading the scroll of Jeremiah, read three or four columns, the king would cut or tear them off with a penknife and throw them into the fire until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. Now, upon hearing a prophecy that points out the things that he was doing against God, King Jehoiakim tore up this prophecy of truth. 
And we can see just in this picture, not that it's written too much like this, but you can see the way this guy's dressed. You can see the way that this guy looks. You can see all the trappings of power that come with his position. And you can see what he does when he's told the truth. Can I get the next slide, Brett? Years later, we're presented with a good king. This king is named Josiah. And we heard about him in, in that reading from the book of Kings. And Josiah, when presented with probably a very similar scroll, responds in a completely different way. As you can kind of see, he tears his robes. He tears the symbol of his power. He tears himself from his throne. And it's the same word. To tear his clothes is the same as to cut the scroll. So when, again, in that sermon, what I said was, when we hear God's truth, what do we do? Do we tear our garments of power? Do we tear our symbols of authority and status and our being first in this world? Or do we actually shoot the messenger? Do we actually tear the, tear the scroll? Do we actually tear the truth? Do we get rid of that? And so I bring it back to the cross. Can I get the last slide? It's mainly just art. Um, this last slide is by a, a Polish painter named Marius Lewandowski. Um, it's called It Has Happened. And it's actually an oil painting, which I love. It looks incredible, eventually. <clears throat> so the truth on Good Friday is that the cross is a tool of systemic violence. And the gospel is that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. On the cross, we see those who are last executed by those who are first. Perhaps the second most crucifixion, most famous crucifixion of all time is that of Spartacus and his fellow slave rebels, who were literally slaves and rebels. And when they were defeated by Rome, Rome put them to death on a cross, just like they did to Jesus. And so this cross is a core symbol of our faith as Christians. But sometimes I think we forget what this symbol means. See, the cross is, is a device of torture and of execution. It is a tool for humiliation and for suffering. The cross today is not merely an electric chair. It's not merely a guillotine. It is inefficient. It is brutal, it is horrific, it is public, it is for the sake of bringing the low to the bottom of the pile. The cross, is, to, to take the metaphor, is a lynching tree where gangs, white gangs would murder individual black people in various countries. The cross in Australia is the hanging points in our jails where our justice system takes the lives of vulnerable indigenous people and gives them a place to kill themselves. The cross, we see it on Christmas Island and Nauru where we take those fleeing the wars that we cause and we put them in a jail cell. The cross, we can see in the way that our Pacifica neighbors' homes are sinking from a climate catastrophe that we caused. The cross is a tool that takes those who are last and pushes them down. And so on the cross, Christ suffered. On the cross, we see where God is in the world. On the cross, we see the tabernacle. On the cross, we see the way that God proclaims, well, we see the God that proclaims release for the captive sight for the blind, life for the dead, freedom from slavery, firstborn of all creation made firstborn of the dead. When confronted with this truth, we must respond, which brings me back to our reading from Second Kings. When presented with the consequences of his actions, with the reality of the suffering he caused, when presented, King Jehoiakim tore the scroll that bore that truth. 
the scroll that testified to his separation from both his God and his neighbor. And the other king, Josiah, tore himself from his throne and prayed. So when confronted with the suffering of the cross, what does King God do? Well, today is Good Friday, and here we get our answer. On the day we tore down God's tabernacle, God tears the curtain. In that first temple of Eden where God breathed life into our human bodies, on the day that we made God's human body breathe its last, God tears the barrier. God breathes life into us again through the Spirit. God now dwells in us, in Christ as a temple. Your body is a temple. We as the body of Christ are the temple, the home of God. <clears throat> Truly I tell you there is no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are one with God in Jesus Christ. Because on the Friday that we killed God, God became alive within us. And God saw that it was good. On the day that we rejected God, God welcomes us home into the temple. And God saw that we were good. On the day that we committed the ultimate act of betrayal, God forgave ultimately and tore the barrier between us. And it was good. On the cross, Christ, the firstborn of all creation, entered into direct communion with the last of the world. On the cross, Christ enters this holy of holies in the centre of the tabernacle once and for all and with an offering of his own blood, tore the curtain to it. On the cross, Christ secures redemption that is eternal. Christ's death is enough to save and to recreate this world. So what does Christ's resurrected life mean? Amen.